Good morning. Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Bonnie Grimaldi, and I'm so glad to see you all here this morning. For the next four Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m., we'll be having the midweek Lenten series called Making Change. And on March 9th at 5 p.m. at our Grace Happens Contemporary Worship Service, we are going to honor the Reverend Doug Gregory and his wife, Dr. Sanji Gregory, for their work with uh, grief counseling for our Tuskegee Valley community that they've been doing here at Grace. We will also be uh, saying thank you to our intern. It'll be her last, um, her last worship service with us, uh, Mackenzie Radlaw. And we continue to pray for the families and the friends of the Tuskegee Valley School community who are still suffering such tragic losses. And we continue to pray for Israel, Palestine, and Ukraine, that the killing of innocent people will stop and the wars will end and there will be justice, healing, and peace. As we go to our prelude, let us turn our hearts and minds toward worship.
That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Please stand as you are able for our confession and forgiveness. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in the snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
to our lessons. Good morning. Our readings are for the second Sunday in Lent. Our first reading is found in Genesis 17th chapter, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offsprings after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offsprings after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall rise to nations, kings, of people and shall come from her, the word of the Lord. The responsive reading is Psalm 22, found on the front page of your Bolton insert. You, hear, you who fear the Lord give praise, all of you of Jacob's line give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, of all of your offsprings of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, do they, or maybe they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. Our second reading is found on the fourth chapter of Romans, verses 13 through 25. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but when there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. That is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to, to the dead and calls into existence, things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall be your descendants, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he was considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No Distrust made him a waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and as he gave glory to God. 
being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it is, was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who has handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to the eighth chapter of Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Do we have children with us today that would like to come forward for a children's sermon? Okay, we do. On top. Yes, looks like we're going to have a few. All right, here we come. More and more, any more, any more. Okay, um, we're going to form a line, and um, yeah, come on, um, that's good. Everybody kind of go in one line if you can, okay? And I'm going to be at one end of it. I guess I'll sit over here. I'm usually over there, so this is a change for me. All right, now what we're going to do, we're going to play a game. We're going to play follow the leader, okay? Yeah. Okay, I see some happy faces. Follow the leader. So this is the line here, and I want you to turn and face me because I'm the leader. Everybody just turn and face me. Okay. And what we're going to do is, you're going to follow what I do, okay, for first round. This is for round one. Okay. And just make sure, um, is it Emma? Uh, yeah, if she can see too. Okay, we're going to make sure everybody can see. That's important. So that we can follow the leader. Okay. All right, I see everybody. All right, here we go. Okay, very good. You guys did that well. Now for round two, I want you to turn around and face the other direction. Just, yep, just turn around and face the other direction. Okay, and I will begin and we'll do the same thing. Well, I, you will follow me, but you won't be looking at me. Okay, here I go.
Okay, all done with round two. How did, uh, how did you feel about round two? No. Yeah. Yeah, you, you couldn't follow me very well if you weren't looking at me, right? You lost everything. Okay. Wow. Okay, that, that's a profound thought. Well, um, I thought that that would be a really good example to illustrate our scripture lesson today. Okay. In our scripture lesson today, Jesus, who is the leader of his disciples, is telling them that he is going to have to undergo some really bad things, okay? And Peter, one of his disciples, speaks up and he says, he wants Jesus, avoid those bad things, okay? And Jesus said, well, anyway, we'll get to what Jesus said in a minute. But Peter wants Jesus to avoid those bad things. Um, do you know what happened? Peter, what happened to Peter is exactly what happened to you guys in round two. He turned around and he wasn't looking at Jesus. He wasn't following Jesus when he said for Jesus, he told Jesus what to do. And we don't really do that, do we? No, no. So he got turned around and he just told Jesus what to do. Uh oh, not good. So, but do you know that that's easy to do? It's easy for us to get turned around in life and forget to follow Jesus, right? Sometimes we get turned around. And how do we keep ourselves from, how do we get turned back around? Doing a good thing, yes, Clay. There you go. Um, we forget to pay attention to our Bible and to Jesus. Awesome. That is a good segue into my next thing I was going to say, Clay, is that coming here helps us keep turning back to Jesus. Keep turning back. We worship together. We pray together. We sing together. And we need to do that because we forget to follow Jesus during the week and during our daily life. So it helps us keep turning back to Jesus, okay? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us Jesus as our leader. Help us follow him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I'm, I have some goodies, and what do you like, Olivia? You like chocolate, like just plain chocolate? Okay, all right, and let's see. So Alex and Emma didn't get any. Oh, you can go to Children's Church, those who are uh, wanting to go to Children's Church. Okay, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Anything look good to you? Hard to decide. Okay. Take a couple. Yeah, you can take more than one. No? Okay. There you go. All right. Okay, there you go. One minute or two. Okay. You can go back to your seat or to Children's Church. Please pray with me. Dear God, help us to get behind Jesus, the one whose love defines us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. The more time I spend thinking back on my life and the more honest I am, 
the more I understand that the things I say and do toward others and the ways that I respond to certain situations are much more about me than they are about the other person or the circumstance. And I think that applies to Peter in today's gospel. Peter's response to Jesus reveals much more about him than it does about Jesus. It's not too hard to see and understand Peter's situation. I think he's afraid. I think he's feeling unprepared and overwhelmed by what is going to happen. And as you and I both know, life can sometimes treat us that way. You know, this is not what I had in mind when I signed up for Fishing for People. I can easily picture Peter saying to himself, I did not sign up for rejection, great suffering and death. This was never my plan. And as we all know, the occasion, life occasionally throws us curveballs that we weren't prepared for. It leads us to places we never would have thought to go. I have a suspicion that Peter is having difficulty with his faith and is attempting to reconcile what he truly believes. He may be questioning his ability to fulfill the demands of faith at this present moment. And as we all know, there are moments when life presents us with those questions. You know what I mean by all that? Have we not been standing next to Peter? There have been moments in our lives when we felt unprepared for the challenges we were facing. What we saw when we peered down the road toward what lay ahead didn't sit well with us. We wanted to shout, no, this can't be happening. It can't be. Have there never been moments when you felt afraid, overwhelmed, or unprepared by life? Have you not had moments when you had no desire to face the challenges that life was presenting to you? Have there not been moments when you question the ability of your faith to withstand life's challenges. Forgive not once, not twice, but 70 times seven. Love my enemy. When your cheek is still red and stinging, turn the other. Think about capturing that exact moment in your life with a photo. How would it appear? Would you like what it shows? Would you rather toss it in the trash or frame and keep it? Those are times when I'm not usually at my best and I don't like these photos in my life or myself. These, without a doubt, these are the kinds of photos that we wish we could take out of the album of our life. Without a doubt, we wouldn't want anybody else to see them. Peter would probably choose to get a retake. Nevertheless, we have all seen those kind of photos in our lives. All of us have seen bad photos of ourselves, photos that portray us as less than or different from who we know ourselves to be or desire to be. We are more than what that single photo can portray, though. I think we know that, but don't live it. We act too quickly to take that one photo, that one moment in time, and interpret it as a perfect representation of our identity and way of life, period. After taking that one photo of ourselves, we say, 
This is me. This is how I live. End of story. We consider that photo to be the final judgment of ourselves. And occasionally we take those kinds of photos, hold them up to someone else, and make a final judgment on them too. You did this. You are this person. I will always see you in this way. But can the whole story really be told in one photo? No. Life is not as much like a photo as it is a motion picture that is dynamic, active, changing, and unpredictable. Not only is there more to Peter than what is presented in today's gospel, but there's also more to you and more to me than the photos we wish we could take out of the album of our life. Each photo is part of a greater story. That is true of Peter, just as it is true of you and me. The gospel today is only one photo, Peter. Peter rebukes Jesus after taking him aside. Jesus then turns and rebukes Peter, calling him Satan. You are the one who deceives. You are the enemy. You are the one who is tempting. Peter, you are not in line. Step behind me. Are you really thinking that Peter only has that one photo? Not me. Peter is identified as the confessor, the one who recognizes Jesus just four verses earlier. You are the Messiah. The man in these two photos is exactly the same. Do you recall the day that full of faith, Peter got out of the boat and walked on the same water that Jesus did? It would be a frame-worthy photo to display on the wall. However, a few minutes later, if you look, if you took another photo, you would see Peter terrified and sinking, calling out for help, and Jesus asking, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Or, <clears throat> or what about the photo of Peter? Excuse me. <clears throat> Just a minute. I get going, I get myself going, and then my throat gets out, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, do you recall that day? That full of faith, Peter got out of the boat, and I said, walked on the same water as Jesus did. Okay, if you took another photo a few minutes later, you would see him terrified and sinking calling out for help. As I said, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I'm sorry, I lost my place. I'm back to where I'm at. Or what about the photo of Peter where Jesus describes Peter as the rock upon which the church will be built? Put that one up against the photo of Peter's three cock-crowing denials of Jesus. What about that photo of Peter dozing off in the Garden of Gethsemane during Jesus' prayer and his awakening at the question, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? It's probably something Peter would prefer to lose. Compare that photo with the one that shows Jesus telling Peter to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, Feed my sheep. 
It's not only Peter who has contradictory or conflicting photos in his life. Recall what Jesus told the man who brought his demon-possessed child to him, that all things are possible for the one who believes. The man said, Lord, I believe. It is a photo of faith, but the photo changes. The man continued, help my unbelief. And how many of us have never seen those two photos in our life? Jesus saw conflicting photos in his life, too. Compare the two photos of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, remove this cup from me, and not what I want, but what you want. Consider the different photos of Jesus hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And into, and Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It's not just them, it's also us. Everybody has those contradicting photos in their lives we could all go back and select the bad photo days in our lives. People have come to me countless times, each describing their life in a single photo. While it's fine for them to use a specific event to describe themselves or their lives, they frequently jump to the conclusion that this is all that they are and how their lives will ever be. They accept that one photo in time as a final judgment. What if we saw those photos of life as they truly are? What if we saw them as only a single still frame from our life's motion picture, a single moment in time? What if that one photo doesn't represent a final judgment, but rather information of what is going on inside of us. Information about our needs, hopes, fears, and struggles. What if it's just a photo of us attempting to make the most of what we had at a particular point in time? And it might not be our best photo. Although it may appear that we failed, that we didn't try very hard, or that we weren't the person we wanted to be, I think that most of us do the best that we can with what we have at that moment. Life can truly be difficult, scary, and overwhelming at times. Faith really does push us to our limits from time to time. Sometimes life gives us things we never wanted or asked for. What if that photo always offers more information than what we usually see? It would be very simple to say, Peter failed based on the photo of today's gospel. He did not make a good disciple. He wasn't faithful. Rebuking Jesus was wrong. Jesus called him out. Peter probably does not want to show people that photo. What if Jesus is really telling Peter, that's not who you are? In his rebuke of him and the sting of calling him Satan. I know you. You are more than what this moment shows. Wake up and claim your belovedness. Trust me in my calling of you. Return to who you are. There are multiple interpretations for every photo. We can allow those single photos of our lives to chain us to the past, permanently labeling and judging us or another. Or we could just glance at them and say, wow, that was a terrible photo day. 
we say, that really isn't who I am and who I want to be. Allowing those photos to call us back to our true selves, center and original beauty. We allowed that bad photo to call us to a new life and way of being. Jesus is constantly doing that with us, just as he is doing with Peter at this moment. Jesus keeps calling us back to ourselves, allowing us to see ourselves through his eyes, being a constant reminder of who we really are and who we are able to become. Most of the time, when we look at those photos, we realize that we have betrayed ourselves and compromised our integrity. We experience regret, disappointment, and shame. Those feelings are not about judgment or punishment. They show that we have contacted the darkness within us, but it's not a permanent state. They point to something else and serve as reminders that there is more that can be depicted by a single photo. When you flip through the album of your life, what do you see? Which photos from your life today chain you to the past? Which photos have you allowed to define who you are, your worth, your value? Which photos would you prefer to remove and never see again? Which bad photo days do you try to keep hidden from both yourselves and other people? These are photos that display our scars and reveal our secrets. They keep us up at night, replaying that scene in an attempt to change it. These are the memories that haunt us and that we simply cannot shake. Have you ever asked for forgiveness? only to keep asking for it over and over again. That most likely was a bad photo day. Even though we would prefer to hide, erase, or alter these photos, they still hold value for us. These things that haunt us can teach us the very things about ourselves that we would prefer not to hear can serve as a calling to a new kind of life. The very things about ourselves that we would prefer not to see can reveal to us a different way of being. Which are the bad photo days in your life? What do you currently hold on to and look at as a definitive photo of yourself in your life? No matter what those photos show or what they might be, they're always a part of a bigger story. Nobody would pay to see a motion picture, watch one frame, and then declare that they had seen and understood the whole thing. Why would we treat one another that way or ourselves? That is definitely not how Jesus treats Peter. The church is built upon the same rock that sank in the sea of doubt. The one who denies Jesus is also the one who feeds and tends to Jesus' sheep. Jesus sees beyond the photo of the moment. That is true of Peter, and it's just as true of you and me. Perhaps we ought to gather up those photos that we'd like to discard and take another look at them, this time through the eyes of Jesus, <clears throat> looking for things we've never noticed before, like the beauty hidden in disfigurement, the light shining in the darkness, the healing that comes out of extreme suffering, the belonging that triumphs over rejection, the life that emerges from death, and the hope that endures in the midst of despair, a holy Lent that would be. 
That's what repentance would be. And when Jesus told Peter to get behind me, he might have meant just that. We are not defined by a single photo in time. We are defined by Christ. It is the love of Christ that sees more in us than we tend to see in ourselves or each other. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we profess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things. Let us pray for the church, 
the well-being of creation, and a world in need. We turn to you for meaning, holy God. Nurture your children the gifts of the Spirit poured out in baptism, and let the mind of Christ guide the church. Give wisdom and discernment to the bishops, pastors, deacons, teachers, and leaders. Lord, in your mercy, we turn to you for renewal, save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution and changing climate. Cleanse the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests, deserts, and wildlife that generations to come may cherish your creation. Lord, in your mercy, we turn to you for justice. Uphold the worth and dignity of every person, especially any who experience hatred, rejection because of gender, ability and sexual orientation, color, vicinity, religion. Lord, in your mercy. We turn to you for healing. Send compassion to helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people. Befriend those who are lonely. Bring hope to any in despair and console all that are bereaved, bereaved, especially those on our prayer list and in our service. Lord, in your mercy. We turn to you for purpose. Remind us of your faithfulness to this congregation. Increase our trust in your guidance and keep us near the cross. Grant that our acts of service will express Christ's sacrificial love. Lord, in your mercy. We turn to you for peace. We honor the saints who lived in the service of others, especially Elizabeth City, deaconess who we commemorate today. Inspire us by their example until we gather into you, kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share with one another a sign of Christ's peace in any way that you're comfortable. You may be seated.
Thank you. You please stand as you are able. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord, our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this cup and bread, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as a body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God. Blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The gifts of God for the people of God.
the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Generous God, at this table, we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life, make our offerings, may our offerings reach out to bring hope and grace to our near and distant neighbors, whom you know and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, share your bread. Thank you, God. 